My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. To another segment of Conquering Your Giants. You know, the reason that we get together week after week, and we've been doing so for years, is to specifically look in the Word of God to find how to apply it to our lives that we might live the more than conqueror kind of life. And to do that, certainly we have to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to talk to you about that today, and I want to set it up with a story that's probably familiar to you, but I think worth repeating to lay a foundation for the subject of living a life in the faith that pleases God. You know, we can have negative faith. We can have a faith that doesn't please God. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it's sort of depicted in this story. There was a real man named Charles Blondin. Does that ring a bell? He was a famous tight rope walker, and he actually stretched a wire across Niagara Falls. Now that in and of itself took great courage to walk that tightrope across Niagara Falls. But he did much more than that. And from the accounts that I have read, and apparently very historic, very accurate accounts, he did some amazing things on this tightrope, including even walking out and balancing a small grill and cooking some food while he was on that tightrope. And he did many other things. He rode a specially made bicycle across the wire and things that you've perhaps seen in the circus. But remember, this is not with a net below him and this is above Niagara Falls, a very dangerous feat. And so now then he takes a wheelbarrow and it's loaded, I think, with sacks of concrete or wheat. I'm not sure what the sacks were filled with, but apparently enough to equal the weight of a human being. And he took that weight in the wheelbarrow, kept it all balanced, walking on the tightrope, and made his way from one side of Niagara Falls to the other. Well, of course, the crowd is cheering. We believe you can do anything, he, he asks them. Is there something that you want to see in particular? And different ideas were thrown out. He said, while I have this wheelbarrow here, I'm going to dump out these sacks and I'm going to take somebody back across with me. How many of you believe that I could carry a human being in this wheelbarrow back across? And of course, they all applauded. Hands went up. Yes, we believe you. And he said, then, you, sir, and he pointed to a man that was clapping for him. You, get into the wheelbarrow. Oh, no, no, not me, not me. Well, then you get in. You're clapping for him. No, 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 not me. You see, it was one thing to say, we believe you can do it. And something totally different when they were required to get in there and prove that they really believed he could do it. My friend, that's how a lot of Christians are. That's the negative faith that I mentioned earlier. We say that we believe, but when it comes down to living it, we don't believe. Or at least our actions would not line up with what we say we believe. Now, there's so much that we can say on the subject of faith. We could do months worth of programming. So how can we hit some highlights in one segment of Conquering Your Giants? Well, let's begin with perhaps the definitive verse when it comes down to living a life of faith that pleases God. Look on your screen. This might be the verse of all verses that we need to commit to memory that we need to think about daily. But without faith, it is a little bit hard to please God. Oh, it doesn't say that, does it? But without faith, it is what? It is utterly impossible, my friend, to please Him. Let that sink in for a minute. You might be so religious. You might be so faithful in your church attendance you might be extremely generous in what you give to missions work. But if you're not trusting God, if you're relying on your own understanding and you are not trusting Him with all your heart, 
you're not pleasing Him to the degree that He is requiring you and me to please Him. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder. Think about this. He wants you to know that there's a reward in it. Now this gets tricky because He doesn't want us to do it just for the reward. He wants us to do it to please Him. We should be pleasing Him. Now let's say it from start to finish. But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Keep looking at that just a minute. Must believe that He is. That's pretty basic. My friend, let me put it to you this way. When we think about Jesus telling the disciples in response to their question, what must we do to work the work of God? He said, the work of God is this, to believe. To believe in the one that He sent. And so we see it right here. You must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. My friend, I want you to think about the life of faith. I want you to begin to drink deeply as to chapter 11 of Hebrews, which has often been called the faith chapter or the hall of faith, a takeoff on hall of fame. And we'll look at these additional scriptures relative to faith, one of them that begins this very chapter. But of course, there's an entire lineup of those who are living out a life of faith. And it comes off of the heels of chapter 10, which is the superiority of faith. In fact, the superiority of faith runs from chapter 10 through chapter 13 of Hebrews. And we see so much about the superiority of Christ. You know, in a recent program that we did, we talked about having the mind of Christ. Go to WTJR's YouTube channel and you can look at all of the great programming that's done here uh, from Quincy, Illinois, and you'll find these programs that will help you to be built up in your most holy faith. There's much great work done here from the Quincy Studios, and I'm privileged to be a small part of that. But you can go back and you can look at some of the programs maybe that you missed that are all associated. Sometimes we even do a series of programs where it takes two or three or even four times to try to pack in the amount of material that we're trying to cover in a given topic. Well, this is one that we could do uh, an eight-part series on. So to try to put it into a half-hour segment is very difficult. But here's what you need to see. The life of faith is the only life that God can bless. We love to quote Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, but to give you hope and an expected outcome. But we've got to read between the lines on that verse and others. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. And then he talks about wanting to prosper you and give you a wonderful outcome. But you see, God is not obligating himself to bless your own plans or the plans that I come up with that have nothing to do with his plan for my life or the word of God. And we can get off into tangents. We can be in our flesh. And that's why in one of the recent segments that we did, it was having the mind of Christ. Because we've got to live by the Word of God. We've got to think like Christ thinks. And He was the ultimate example of living by faith, of living this life for eternity, of coming to take your sins and mine upon Himself. The Bible says that God the Father was pleased. Think of that. He was pleased to pour out the punishment that you and I deserved. 
and to pour it out upon his son. Why? Because it was a bigger picture. It was something that had an eternal implication. If you and I are making our judgments based upon temporary things, then we're missing out on the life that pleases God because things are not always as they seem. And what we can see with our physical eyes is only temporary. The life of faith requires that we see the unseen. You and I serve a God that calls things that are, that are not, excuse me, as though they already are. Let me say that again. He calls things that are not as though they already are. That's ultimately getting in step with Him when we look to eternity, when we think about this life and even our afflictions as being light and momentary in light of the weight of glory that's going to be revealed in the sons of God. My friend, this life is very brief and fleeting and subject to change without notice. And if we're living for this life, we're missing it. We're missing what God has prepared for us. And so when we get into this great hall of fame or hall of faith, we begin to see some of the great basics as it relates to living a life of faith that really blesses God. You know, this is kind of a side point, but you will see, especially in difficult times like our nation is experiencing now, God bless America. You know what? I want America to bless God, don't you? And so when we say, God, would you bless me? It's okay. He, he's okay with that prayer. But why? That we might bless Him. Take a look at this next scripture. For we walk how? We walk by faith. This is just line upon line, precept upon precept. We're laying a foundation here. We walk. We who are saved. We who have the Holy Spirit in us. We walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, so if that's the case, then what is this faith whereby we are walking? In fact, let's just go ahead and look at that Hebrews 11.1 1 passage. Because in that, we define what this life of faith really looks like. Take a look on your screen. I want you to notice how this sentence begins. <clears throat> Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, keep looking at that verse. And just pretend for a moment that that word N-O-W is not there. Let's just assume that that word faith was right next to the quotation and that it had a capital F. Isn't it true that the sentence would be grammatically correct? I said grammatically correct. If that word now had been removed. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, comma, the evidence of things not seen. Well, let me just answer that for you. Yes, it would be grammatically correct. But apparently from the word of God and the way that we see this Hebrews 11.1 1 show up in the Bible it would not be theologically sound. Okay, let's talk about that. You and I are going to be judged on every idle word. That's what the Bible tells us. And that's why we have to really think about the power of our tongue. I'm going to talk about that next week. The power of life and death are in the tongue. But if we are going to be judged based upon every idle word... And if our great God is without sin, then He never employs an idle word. Everything that God gives us in Holy Writ is inspired by God. God breathed, theonoustos in the Greek language. It's breathed by God. And He never ever makes a mistake. And therefore, when we read in that a Hebrews 11 one passage, N-O-W-F-A-I-T-H, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, I think it must have an implication 
that that defining word, N-O-W, is very important in the theological soundness or the biblical truth of what that sentence is saying and the implications for you and me living a life of faith that pleases God. If there is a now faith, there must be a not right now faith. And if you and I are creatures of time, at least right now, we're living where there's a past, present, and future. When we get to eternity, that won't be the case. But right now is different than yesterday. And right now is different than 10 years from now. So my friend, if you and I are going to employ a faith, the faith that pleases God, it needs to be a right now faith. You say, I used to be really close to God. My faith used to be so strong. That's not doing you one bit of good today, my friend. That faith yesterday, as somebody put it, is just like a canceled check. And faith that you might work up 10 years from now, that's like a promissory note that you may never collect. So if yesterday's faith, or last year's faith, or when you were a student in school's faith, used to be, and it's like that canceled check, it's not spendable today. And a promissory note that may never be collected on, that's not collectible today. So it is the now faith, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, the right now faith that becomes that surety for you, that becomes that spendable currency for you to do life with. And in living life in that currency of right now faith. And of course tomorrow you need to be in that right now faith again. And so it is the next day and the next day until we are in eternity. My friend, that's the only faith. That's the only kind of faith that pleases God. To say to Him, well, I, I used to really be strong in the Lord. I can't speak for God in this regard, but if you were a, a parent and you heard your child say, you know, I used to really love my mama. I used to really have a close walk in friendship with my daddy. And the implication is it's no longer like that. That's sad. That's not something that would please a mom or a dad. I don't think it would please a heavenly father. So if you and I want, genuinely want to please God... We've got to stop looking at the things that we see and relying upon that. I want you to look at this next verse. Another definitive verse from Proverbs. But I want you to think about that as it relates to the life of faith. Trust in the Lord with a little bit of your heart. Doesn't say that. Trust in the Lord with most of your heart. Doesn't say that. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not. That's the old English. What would we say today? Don't you dare lean unto your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, in all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. My friends, you see how we could preach weeks of sermons just from this hall of faith. We could begin to look at the life of Abraham. We could go through and see what he did. We could uh, look at Sarah herself. We could see how God tested Abraham. We could see the life of Jacob and the life of Joseph and how Moses was a man of faith. My friend, you and I are called to this generation and we are called to be his witnesses for such a time as this. But I want you to think of the implications for your own children, grandchildren, parents, siblings, co-workers, whoever you have influence with. If you're like somebody on one side of Niagara Falls that's applauding and talking about the great capabilities 
of this God of heaven. And then when he calls on you to get in his wheelbarrow and to suffer a little bit, to get into his wheelbarrow and go through a season of testing, to get into his wheelbarrow and walk back across that tightrope when nobody else is in there but just you and just in the capable hands of Almighty God, maybe cut off from family members and friends, maybe called upon for a season in the desert. Are you willing to live that out with such an expectation that you're not dependent upon the word from some other human being? You see, we are so quick, especially now, with today's social media, the quickness of communications through smartphones and text messaging. When something hits us, it's so easy to just start texting or start calling and to try to hear a human voice bring us consolation. My friend, I want to challenge you on that. I want to encourage you to become more and more a man of faith more and more a woman of faith, not reliant upon all that's taking place around you, not leaning upon your own understanding and having that understanding strengthened by the voice of another person unless that other person is taking you right to the holy word of the living God. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now I want to go full circle and I want you to look at that Hebrews 11.6 passage. I want you to read it on your screen here in just a moment. And I want you to really think about how you live your life, what your goals are. Now you're not answering to me and I'm not answering to you, but we can be that iron sharpening iron, can't we? We can encourage one another. We can ask the Holy Spirit to bring encouragement and conviction to one another so that we walk out this life of faith. Look on your screen. If we're not living that kind of life, my friend, then we're really not pleasing God. We can make up what we think is pleasing Him. We can give even more money to missions and we can justify that we're not living a life of faith, but that's like living out some superstitious plan for life. Somebody that goes out and bows down under a tree and they think that's pleasing God. Or somebody that's in a false religion or cult and they're carrying out what that cult dictates and they think they're pleasing God. They're not. They're pleasing the devil. And you and I can do a lot of things that are, quote, religious that has nothing whatsoever to pleasing God. It's the life of faith. And look right there and you'll see, but without it, without faith, that right now, living in faith today kind of faith, without it, it's not just hard to please God, my friend. It is impossible. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let me say it in the negative. You and I have to choose not to doubt. But what is doubt? It's a lack of right now faith. Here's a great old verse. Some of you have been blessed as I have through the years by Annie Johnson Flint. And she writes this, I will not doubt, though all my ships at sea come drifting home with broken masts and sails. That might be how you feel today, my friend, like your ship is just about to sink. I will believe the hand which never fails from seeming evil worketh good for me. And though I weep because the sails of my ship are tattered, still will I cry while my best hopes lie shattered. God, I trust you. I will not doubt, though all my prayers return, unanswered from the still white realm above. I will believe it is an all-wise 
love. Can you do that, my friend? Can you believe it's from God when you don't hear, when you don't experience, when you don't feel in the flesh an answer at this moment? Can you still live that life of right now faith? You must if you're going to please Him. I will believe it's an all-wise love which has refused the things for which I yearn. And though at times I cannot keep from grieving, yet the pure ardor of my fixed believing, undimmed, undimmed shall burn. I refuse to doubt, though sorrows fall like rain, and troubles swarm like bees from a hive. I'll believe the heights for which I strive are only reached by anguish and by pain. And though I groan and writhe beneath my crosses, I yet shall see through my severest losses the greater gain, God's plan, the eternity in what I'm going through right now. Last stanza. I refuse to doubt. I will not doubt. Well anchored is this faith. Like some staunch ship, my soul braves every gale. So strong its courage that it will not quail to breast the mighty unknown sea of depth. Oh, may I cry, though body parts with spirit, I do not doubt, so listening worlds may hear it, that I may say this with my last earthly breath. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may my brother, may my sister, and may I, with our last earthly breath, keep crying out, God, I trust you. I don't have to see it in order to believe it. I trust you. I don't have to have every prayer answered the way that I think it ought to be answered. God, I trust you. And I realize that yesterday's faith is gone and tomorrow's faith might be, but is not right now. And God, I'm asking you to help me be built up in my most holy faith, that right now faith, and live in it. Walk by faith and not by sight, that it pleases you, God. That's what I ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. God bless you, my friend. You can contact Duke Duvall at WTJR-TV, 222 North 6th Street, Quincy, Illinois, 62301, or go to his website, www.dukedevall.com. Be sure and join us again next week for Conquering Your Giants.